Good morning. It's great to be back with you this morning as we continue in our story in the book of Jonah. And if you weren't able to be with us last week, either online or in person, I encourage you to go back and check it out as we look at how God interacts with us, how God interacts with other people around us, those that uh, are trying to obey him, those that are absolutely rejecting anything he said and going in the opposite direction, all the way to how does God interact with those people who are just ignorant, maybe don't even know he exists, or that he actually cares about them. And so we're looking at that, and it's all found in the book of Jonah. And it's just been a, a great time so far, and I'm really excited to continue the story with you. So I think you turn in your Bibles. So if you didn't bring one with you, that's fine. Um, there's a Bible in front of you somewhere in Iraq. And if you take that out and you go to page about 753, it's easier for you to find the book of Jonah. You'll find it or turn in your Bible app or online if you're at home and journey along with us. Because I just want you to have the story in front of you to realize um, how cool it is, really. <laughs> how interesting it is. And when I skip little passages here and there that you actually know what's there and you can follow along. So let's just open in a word of prayer as we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that you've, you've gifted us with the story of Jonah, this, this interaction that you had with Jonah. And you've, you've allowed it to be written down and recorded in history so that we can look into it and we can see your heart, your heart for those that, that serve you, your heart for those that rebel against you, and your heart for those that don't know you. And I just pray today as we look at who you truly are, that something inside of us will change, that something inside of us would actually long to A, get to know you a little bit better, and be to represent you really well to the world around us. So I pray that today in Jesus' name, amen. Well, so far, the book of Jonah, if you've, if you've been in church before, maybe as a little kid or growing up in church, this is the, the, it's always Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the fish, and the fish is supposed to be, or the whale's supposed to be the biggest news of the story, and I'm just downplaying that whole thing. It's not really. Um, there's so many cool things in this book for sure, but we've gone through that phase already last week, so if you missed it, you got to backtrack and go there. And we looked at how the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and God asked Jonah to go to this place called Nineveh, and that he would go and speak to uh, these people that God was bringing judgment against them, and they were going to be overthrown. And Jonah has decided, no, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to go anymore and be your servant. I don't want to go tell these people anything like that. And so he ran. He ran in the opposite direction. And we looked at how God pursued him through a storm and pursued him through his lives with these sailors and got him back basically to a place where we're starting up today, which is the word of the Lord comes back to Jonah a second time. And so that's where we're going to go. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. And so I love this because it shows that, A, God is like willing to start again fresh with us. And there's so many times that when God's word comes to us and he speaks into our life and we reject it or we say, no thanks, that he's patient and he brings circumstances to bring us back to this point. But the word of the Lord comes back to Jonah. This is right after he gets spit back up on the, the ground. And uh, Jonah did this smart thing this time around. And some of us take once, twice, three times around. But it says oh, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord this time. And he starts to go towards Nineveh. So as we look at that, we go in and it says there in uh, Jonah chapter 3 that Nineveh was a very large city. And when we say that, it's known to be at that time... Uh, about 120,000 people. And so then that was large. That was large. That's like Red Deer and surrounding areas. And that's kind of how Nineveh was. It was a little region area, about 120,000 people. And it says there it would take Jonah three days to go through it. Three days to go into the city and get across it to let people know um, with this message. And I love what it says next. It says, Jonah began um, going about a day's journey in. And so you know, the message was in 40 days, God's going to overturn the city because it's, it's evil, because of everything it's doing. And Jonah gets a day in and things already start happening. Now, Nineveh wasn't known as a very great place to go. And you can see why Jonah didn't want to go there. Was Nineveh was the, the hub, the center, the capital of Assyrians and what they were up to in the world. And at that time, very, very cruel, cruel people. And uh, they conquered nations around them, but they didn't just conquer nations. They would be cruel about it and all kinds of horrific things. They mangle people, they chop off 
parts and those kind of things, skin people, and create monuments of skulls and bodies and everything so that people would be terrified of them. So people wouldn't want anything to do with them. And so if they even hinted that they were going to come take over your city, you basically ran and said, here you go, you know, it's all yours. Uh, Nineveh is located in like modern day Iraq. And so you kind of can see a little bit how maybe today it would be like one of us or me, say, a preacher deciding that I'm going to go over to ISIS and I'm going to go into one of their main camps and I'm going to tell them what they're up to is bad. And God isn't happy with them. And God's about to judge them. And that would be a scary moment for sure. And, you know, whether or not I'd be willing to do that, I think is is a legit concern. I haven't haven't wrestled that through. I should have done that before I said that out loud. But uh, what what would I do? Jonah ran. And we're going to look at why he ran. But that's probably a legit reason. The second reason that Jonah struggled with was, do they actually deserve... (laughs) to even have the opportunity to turn? Should they even get an opportunity to like turn away from what God wants to do with them? I mean, what they're up to and the way they treated people and they were into false um, pagan religions, of course, and and, uh, into fertility gods and they did prostitution as part of worship and they were a mess and Jonah was an Israelite and these Assyrians were a threat to them and constantly uh, a threat to overtaking them and eventually actually did. And so here is this guy that's going to go tell your number one enemy, the cruelest people, that God actually was going to judge them or they could turn to him because God's merciful. And so he's not so sure. But a day's journey in, he just starts, and I don't think he's trying that hard. I'm guessing. That's just my interpretation. He didn't want to go in the first place. I don't think he's there all being kind and compassionate to these people. He's probably ticked right off. And he just starts telling them, proclaiming, look, 40 days, you guys are toast. And uh, he gets a day in, and what happens? All of a sudden, it says within the first day, the Ninevites believe him. They believe God. A fast is being proclaimed. And all of them, it says, all of them, from the greatest to the least, puts on sackcloth. Sackcloth was a sign of humbling oneself. It was a sign of submission. It was a sign of repentance, that you would take off your good clothes and you would consider yourself not worthy. And so you put on this itchy, think of it like a sack, like a potato sack. That's not fun. You put that on and you basically repent and you mourn. And this is what the people start doing. And so even it says Jonah's warning reaches the king of Nineveh. And so you'd wonder, okay, what is this king going to do? This king over this region. Here's this prophet guy coming from another nation, this people of Israel, coming and telling us that we're horrible people. We're going to be judged and we better stop and repent. And it comes to the king. The king has a choice. Should we wipe him out, take him out, kill him? Is it one guy? He's by himself. And it says the king gets up off his throne, takes off all his royal clothes, strips himself down, and puts on sackcloth himself. And goes and sits in a pile of dirt with his people. It's incredible. It's like the first day of Jonah's like 40 days of telling these people what's going to come. And everybody just says, you know what? We're, we're in. <laughs> it's amazing. So here's the thing. Jonah and the whale. We think the whale or the fish is like the biggest miracle of the story. That's not it. This is it. This is incredible. These are powerful people. This is an entire group of people who have never heard of this God, Yahweh, don't really care. They've heard of him maybe in context of he's a Hebrew God or he's one of the God for the Israelites, but not theirs. And this stranger comes in and they just go, yeah, I think you're right. We need to stop being evil. We need to repent. We need to deal with this thing. Here's what you need to know. The biggest miracle that God will ever do in your life is when he offers you mercy and grace instead of judgment. You realize that? The greatest miracle that God ever does for anybody 
is when he doesn't give us what we deserve, which is mercy. But he actually gives us what we don't deserve, which is relationship. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ today and you are in right standing with God because you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then he has already done the greatest miracle he'll ever do in your life. You're in right relationship with him. There's nothing bigger he can do for you. He can heal you, yes. Maybe if you're sick, you think, but you know what? It's still not as big. He can change your circumstances today, but that's still not as big as putting someone in a right relationship with himself For all of eternity, that's the biggest thing he can ever do for you. So all of our prayer requests that come up before him are all really extra grace and mercy that we're asking for, which we can do and legitimately should. But just recognize that's the greatest thing. Jesus even talked about these Ninevites when he was preaching. He said it was amazing that these people believed God and would turn to him at the preaching of Jonah. And he mentions that, like at the preaching of Jonah, the guy who was like reluctant, rebellious, didn't care about these people, and the whole city just repented. Jesus said, it's amazing because the people he was preaching to, which was his own people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, rejected Jesus' message. And he said, you know, there's coming a day when the Ninevites will stand up and judge my own people because they heard my father and repented and you guys resist. It's amazing. Ironically, actually, Jonah's message of the prophecy, what he proclaimed was the city would be overturned within 40 days actually came about. It just wasn't as he had planned. In other words, the whole city turned around, turned upside down from the greatest to the least. They all repented. They all Ask for forgiveness. They ask for mercy. And this is what happened. The king proclaimed, let everyone, everyone out there urgently call on God. Let them give up all their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? Maybe God will relent. Maybe he'll have compassion. Maybe he'll turn away from his anger against our sin so that we will not perish. And it says this, so when God saw what they did, Now, this is, for me, this gets a little, it it pushes me a bit. Saw what they did. I mean, this is, let's just assume day one. Push it if you want. Day two, day three, day four. They're turning around. And God saw what they did and that they're willing to turn around. And so he does exactly that. He, they turn from their evil ways for how many days? Not very long. (laughs) We know it's not very long because Jonah's hoping that in 40 days that they're going to get punished. So it's within a short window of time they turn from their evil ways. Now, if you're like me and someone repents or says they're going to turn around, you kind of want to sit back and wait a little bit longer than a couple days to see how sincere they are. Right? I mean, isn't that natural? If someone says, you know, will you forgive me? And you're like, you know, eh, can you try for a while? Like, let's uh, try this all out here, this whole repentance thing before I go there. But God immediately sees them and he relents. He does not bring on them destruction that he had threatened. And so the theme of Jonah continues. We heard it last week and we're gonna hear it again. And that's this, the Lord is ready. The Lord is anticipating an opportunity to give mercy and grace to anyone Everyone who calls out, whether it was Jonah who was doing the exact opposite by running from God that he knew he was supposed to do, whether it was the sailors who were just caught up in the mess and didn't know who this Yahweh was who was dealing with Jonah, or whether it's Nineveh who was doing direct offensive evil before God. He's eager. He's anticipating. He's leaning forward wanting to see how people will respond. But to Jonah, this is where the book gets a little bit weird, and we're going to spend most of our time on this next week. But Jonah, this seemed really wrong. (laughs) And he became angry. 
When, when God relents and God decides not to do this judgment thing on these people, Jonah's not impressed. He's like, no, that, that's not right of you. That's not the right thing to do. In fact, as we get into it next week, it's just teaser, you know, teaser for next week. Jonah's like pretty adamant here. He is mad. And he's accusing God of not being right, or that means righteous. God, you're not righteous. And what he's saying is, I am. See, when we say God isn't right in doing something, what we're saying is, I'm more righteous than God. I know what is right. I know what the right thing to do is. And God does not. That's a, that's a pretty strong position to go up against him. But here's where we start to see the heart of why Jonah kind of ran in the first place. And so he prays. He doesn't pray, forgive my bad attitude because I'm really angry at you, God, and fix my heart. That's not what he prays. I don't even know if I'd call this a prayer. Call it a rant. Call it a lot of things. But scripture says it's a prayer. So I guess you can be pretty angry at God and pray at the same time. This is Jonah. He's like, Lord, this is what we were chatting about. So we get a window now into knowing when God told Jonah to go to Nineveh that there was a conversation here. In other words, Jonah was explaining and wrestling with God. And when God tried to convince him he was doing the right thing, Jonah split. He says, look, this is what I said when I was back home before I ran in the first place. That's why I tried to forestall this. What does that mean? I tried to prevent it. I try to make sure this wouldn't happen, that Nineveh wouldn't repent. What he was trying to do by running was to make sure the 40 days would happen. So you hear God and you go, my enemy is going to be destroyed in 40 days. And you want me to go tell them to repent so that it won't happen? Hmm, if I could just disappear for 40 days, then God will have to destroy him. So he runs. He's like, that's why I took off. I didn't want to be this person that has to tell these people who you are. That's not the right thing. He says this, I knew. <laughs> I knew this about you, God. I knew you're generous and gracious. You're compassionate. I know you're slow to become angry. I, I know that you abound in love. You're a God that relents from sending calamity. And this is why I'm mad. Kind of a little weird, isn't it? He's got some heart issues going on here. We'll deal with that next week. Another tag. Where does it come from? How can we get ourselves in that position? Well, we can get ourselves in that position. But he's like, I, I knew this was true about you. Well, how did he know that? You see, right back where the very first person that was going to represent God to an enemy or to his own people group was this guy named Moses. And Moses was going to go to Pharaoh and he was going to represent God's wishes to an enemy, which was Pharaoh who was oppressing his people. And Moses was going to have to lead God's people. And Moses negotiated with God and he's like, I don't even know who you are. I, I don't know your name. I don't know what you're like. Can you please give me some info? And so we see this, and I want to I want to give it to you so you understand why Jonah knew is because this was what was given to anybody who would follow Yahweh, and it's found in Exodus chapter thirty-four. So the Lord passed in front of Moses, and he called out, "I'm Yahweh." I'm the Lord. In other words, I'm Lord over all. I am a sovereign God. I am in charge of all things. That's me. I'm the God of compassion. That's in me. I'm of compassion and I'm of mercy. It's my character. I am slow to anger. And I am filled up in my who I am with unfailing love and faithfulness. That is me. I'm a compassionate, merciful God. I am consistent, I am faithful, and I am loving. And I lavish love on people. Thousands of generations will receive love from me. That's who I am. I forgive iniquities. 
I forgive rebellion, which we saw in Jonah. I forgive sin. Well, what, what's the difference on all of these? Well, there, there are a little bit differences there. One, iniquities is like, I, just ignorance around sin. And as Ninevites and the sailors in the story, I mean, they're, they're sinning, but they, they also haven't been told what's right and what's wrong yet. They haven't got to know God. And so in their, in their ignorance, I guess you could say, they're just sinning. And God says, I'm a God that forgives that. And the rebellion piece is Jonah, again, was he knew better but decided to do his own thing and go the opposite direction. I, I'm a God that forgives that too. And, and sin in, in the scripture is all-encompassing. It's all of that. And it's actually, it's actually in us, in our DNA. It's born in us. It, it's passed on, actually. And so I'm able to forgive that too. And so whether or not someone knows they're sinning or doesn't know, acknowledges or not acknowledges, I am a God who wants to forgive that. That's my character. He didn't stop there though, and I like to stop there. That's awesome. But he goes a little farther and God also reveals, he says, look, but, so I'm this, I'm this over here, but I'm also a God who doesn't excuse guilty. Now, for all of us, you should immediately go, well, that's a contradiction. If you don't excuse it when they're guilty, isn't that what forgiveness does? Isn't that what mercy is really doing? If mercy is not giving someone what they deserve, that's what mercy is, then doesn't that really mean you're just excusing their behavior? If grace is giving to someone what they can't earn or don't deserve, like right relationship with God, then, then how can those fit together? How can you be a just and right God? And, and so what people have typically done is they see this and then they determine that this has to be then some people that are the inside relationship with God well, they get all this forgiveness, grace, compassion stuff. And then the people outside of this, like, chosen people, they get all this no excuse, God. Like, no excuse, you're held accountable, punishment. And this is where Jonah's at. He's like, hey, I knew this, but you're not doing what is right because you're excusing. You're excusing their behavior. So... This is where Jonah's upset. He's like, they're on the outside. He had no problem receiving forgiveness, grace, and mercy for himself. That was fine. He was on the inside. He's one of God's people. He was one of the Hebrews. He was an Israelite. That's okay. But Ninevites, don't, they, what, why would you do that? Don't excuse their behavior, forgive my behavior, but don't, this is, this is a dilemma. And I want you to know that when we get stuck on this, we can end up like Jonah. And that's going to be next week. What's going on here? R Thankfully, on the other side of the cross, <laughs> on the other side of when Jesus came and died on the cross for us, we finally get to see the whole picture and we get to understand how it all comes together C can i show you the picture can i show you what god has revealed to us why is so necessary that jesus came and so i want to turn to romans chapter 3 for you and i have it for you romans chapter 3 and this is the picture because the rest of that was no excuse and judgment comes against generation after generation after generation which seems horrible that Okay, God says he unlovishes his love to thousand generations, which should be a hint there that that's bigger than, but his judgment also passes on. Like sin passes on. It affects all of us. And so Romans chapter three reminds us of this. It says, look, everyone has sinned. We're all in the same boat. All of us fall short of God's glorious standard. In other words, none of us will ever deserve the mercy the compassion, the grace that we're talking about. Yet God, yet God, but God, if it wasn't for him deciding to do something, 
we would be in trouble. Yet God, in his grace, in his mercy, freely, freely means you didn't earn it. It's not because you were the right person born in the right place at the right time. Freely makes us right in his sight. How? Well, he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. In other words, there is a penalty for sin. We can't excuse sin. God can't do it in his character. He can't excuse it. He can't pretend. He can't just look the other way and go, oh, it's just, it doesn't matter today. Look at them. They're being really repentant today. Okay, okay, you get mercy too. No, he's like, no, no, no. Sin has to be dealt with. For God to be a righteous, right judge and just, Jonah's right. This doesn't seem right. How is it dealt with? Well, he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of sin. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. A punishment given to Jesus for sin. So people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood in these people's place, but also in our place. God was able to be merciful to these Ninevites and to Jonah for the same reason, that their penalty for the sin was coming and it was placed on Jesus. And here's what I I think. No matter what someone has done to you and you're faced with this dilemma, we'll talk about this more next week, where you need to give them grace and mercy. If you saw what Jesus put up with and what was put on him and what he was put through on the cross. I think every one of us would say, okay, I think that's enough justice. I don't think there's anything that we would expect Jesus to have gone through that doesn't equal what we would need the worst of the worst of the worst of the Ninevites, the sinners in our lives to go through. Jesus went through it all. And the reason why, and some people stumble on this, why Why would God do this? Why would he make him suffer so bad? What kind of God is that? It's a just and righteous God because the worst of the worst of the worst had to be placed on Jesus and in Jesus paid for. Including you and me. So let's continue because he actually explains that. So he goes on, he says, look, this sacrifice, what what Jesus went through, what God did on Jesus shows that God was being fair, just, right. When he held back and did not punish those who had sinned in times past. The Ninevites, they're here in the story. Jonah's here in the story explained. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his rightness, his righteousness, that he is right, that he is just, that his mercy can be given freely, his grace can be given out because of what he did on the cross to Jesus. This demonstrates his rightness for he himself is fair and he is just. He has to honor both sides of his character. There is no excuse for sin. So he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. And therefore, they're able to be now placed in right position with God. That is grace. Not deserved, not earned. Placed in right relationship with him. You need to know forgiveness is never fair without punishment. Grace is not fair unless someone is punished for that. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, we're able to be gracious and forgiving to others because we've received it because we understand that Jesus took it all for them and for us. So Jonah's like, I know, God, I knew who you were. And you know what he ends with? Basically, now, Lord, take my life away. (laughs) It's better for me to die. I don't want to see it. 
I don't want to see this person get what they didn't deserve. I don't want to see it. Take me out. And the Lord replied, hey, Jonah, do you have a right to be angry? So there's your memory verse for next week. Easy, Jonah 4.4. The Lord said to you, put your name in there because you need this a lot and I need this a lot. How many times? I think this is a good memory verse for all of us. The Lord says to Sean, Sean, seriously, do you have the right to be angry in light of what? In light of the mercy and grace I've received? In light of my sin that was paid for? Do I ever, can I position myself in a place where I am right, therefore God must be wrong? So it's a great verse. Do you have the right to be angry? By the way, Jonah's response, spoiler alert, is yes. And I've heard people say that often as well. It's a bad posture to be in, but we'll get to there next week. How many times did I say that today? I want to show you that this wrestle that we see in this book is so, so significant. This is really, how does God's free will wrestle alongside of our free will? God can do what he wants. I want to read you this this passage of scripture in Jeremiah. Jeremiah was another prophet that God had asked to go speak judgment to to his, his own people. And the Lord says to Jeremiah, look, can I do what a potter does with clay? Like, can I be God? Are you going to let me be God? Like, you know how a potter can, you know, shape and mold things and do what he wants and be creative? Am I not allowed to be that way? Do, am I not allowed to have freedom and interact with other people's freedom? Is that not me? So he says this, it's an amazing passage. You need to get this. So if I announce to a certain nation that they're going to be uprooted, they're torn down, they're going to be destroyed, I announce that, that they need to get rid of their evil ways and, and I will destroy them. But the nation changes their mind. The nation actually repents. The nation actually says, forgive us. You know what? I'm not going to destroy them. Can't I do that? Am I God? Am I allowed to do that? And you know what, Israel, your people, his people, he's saying, if I say to another nation or to a person, hey, I got some great plans for you. I'm going to build you up into a great nation. I'm going to make something great of you. But they turn and go evil and they go their own direction. I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do. I'm not going to bless them. I'm not locked in. Am I not free to interact with other people's freedom of will? Am I Lord or am I not Lord? Am I in control of the clay or am I not? And this was a wrestle that Jonah had, but this is a wrestle that his people have, that Israelites had. And actually they still wrestle with this. The the whole point of this book is, who is God's people? Is it just who's here in the room? And for Jonah, it was like, they thought they knew who God's people were. And they were it. And the Ninevites were not. And the Lord's like, "Mm, see, the thing is, I am Lord of all. (laughs) And when it talks about, you need to go to Nineveh because their sin has rise up against me because actually, I'm their Lord. Yeah, they don't know it. (laughs) They don't worship me. But they're my people. And I'm asking you to go and tell them who I am. I want you to give them an opportunity to find out who I am so that I can be gracious and merciful if they turn to me. Now, what happened to Jeremiah was interesting. The people turned to him, his own people. This is God's Israelite people. Turned to him and said to Jeremiah, hey, don't waste your breath. You know what? We're going to do whatever we want. We're going to live the way we want. And we're stubbornly going to follow our own evil desires. That's what they did. So here's the thing, just because God is compassionate, graceful, merciful, forgiving, soft, easygoing, wants to embrace them, does not mean that people are going to go, oh good. Lots of people will say, who cares? And God says, all right, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to show you who I am, to tell you what I think is wrong. 
and, and you, I'm placing it, you get to respond to me. And the th- funny thing is, in Jonah, we saw the opposite. They just believed God and said, all right, we're in. And I don't think because Jonah was a better preacher than Jeremiah. So the big question, the big question is, what is the, what are we, what are, what are we, what is the church here? What are we doing here? Who are we? Are we the ones that are in and we're the ones that get the mercy, compassion, grace, and all that? And then the other, the others out there, they're the ones that, you know, are going to get the wrath and the judgment and they're going to get what's coming to them. Like, are we just, if you're, if we are, let's say we're on the in. When you're on the in with God, in other words, you have a right relationship with God and now you're in a, a position of serving him. Do I know, do you want to know what your job is? To go tell the others who he is to give them an opportunity. That's why you, it's, it's why you're here. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal savior, then your job is not to sit here and just bask in it. I, I'm sorry, that's actually not what the church is supposed to do. We have a job. Jesus said, my disciples will go and they'll tell everyone that the kingdom of God is available. They'll tell everyone about my father. They'll tell them what's available for them and let them decide. Yes, some people will say, who cares? And others that we think, well, there's no way they would respond. There's no way they should respond. And we wish that God would just wipe them out, might actually be the very ones that say, all right, I'm in. We don't get to decide is one of the points of Jonah. Who is God's and who isn't because they're all his. That none would perish, Jesus said. That's why I've come, that none would perish, that everyone would have an opportunity. So if you look at our vision statement at Crossroads, this is it. It's our vision. You want to come and be a part of this community. And our community has to do this. Our job as a community here is to give everyone, everyone, not who we think needs it or doesn't need it, everyone an opportunity, an opportunity. To have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean they'll take it. Some will take it, will be shocked about. Some will resist it. But that's our job. That's why we exist. We exist here as a church, as a community to do this. And if you want to be a part of this community, can, can I, what, can, let's get going. Let's do this. And sometimes we look at our community and we imagine it's, it's a Nineveh community. But look at what happened to Nineveh. Sometimes the people that we think really will resist it the most because of their behavior are actually the most desperate to find something else. We can't sit back and decide. And you're in a place, you're in a neighborhood, you're in a workplace, you're in a family. And sometimes we try to sit back and decide who we think will respond. It, forget it, you're gonna, you're gonna mess it up. Don't worry about that. Your job is to simply represent who Jesus is in word and in deed. And then it says in our vision, say, and then together we will compassionately or mercifully, that's what that means. Compassion and mercy impact our world in the way in which the Father would do it. That's why we exist. It's super exciting. And so first question is, look, it's hard to do this if you struggle with whether or not God's actually given you mercy and grace first. But if you've truly tasted and you understand that mercy has been given and grace has been given yours, in other words, you're not getting from God what you deserve, but he's relented. And you have got from God a relationship with Jesus Christ that you didn't earn. That awareness should rock you to the core where you go, why would I not want to tell people what God did for me? I'm not telling you to go preach the judgment out there. You need to tell your story. And if you don't know what your story is, then you need to, you need to pray about that. Maybe you haven't tasted it yet. I invite you to taste the mercy of God. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you today. 
of who you are. You are a gracious, compassionate, merciful God. You're, you're slow to become angry with me. And that, that's just such good news. And you're quick, you're quick to forgive the stuff that I, 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 I do that's just pure rebellion. The stuff that I don't even know I'm doing, but it's offensive to you. I thank you that you're willing to forgive that. And for who I am at the core, which is a selfish person, that you would forgive my nature. Heavenly Father, I pray that for each one of us today, that that would just sink deeper today. And we would recognize, unlike Jonah, that because we're such recipients, that we would rejoice when other people find that truth too. Would you give us courage, embolden us to simply share who you said you are? It is good news. May you create in us to become a community, a community of mercy and compassion in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.